Uh, good evening and welcome to session number uh, four of the Bible's big story, the gospel promised and fulfilled. And let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you again for today. We just come before you and we want to glorify you. We want to glorify your son. You deserve our praise and our worship. And Father God, we thank you so much that you have desired to enter into us, uh, in, into a covenant with us, that you desire a relationship with us, even though we, we failed, even though we sin. You are merciful to not only provide the means for us to the relationship to be restored, but also you, you have given your spirit to dwell within us and to, to purify our heart. Father, I just pray that as we study the truths about the fall of mankind, that we would not look down upon Adam and Eve as it, it could be easy for us to do, but that we would look into our own heart and see that, that all of us would have made the same mistake because uh, it's only through you and our dependence upon you that we can really um, have success and keep your law. And so Father God, as we study your word, that you would just give us eyes to, to see what we see and ears to hear what we hear, and that your spirit would transform us through the preaching and the teaching of your word. It's in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things uh, through obedient faith only. Amen. Okay, so good evening. Let's go ahead and just, what I'll do first is uh, give you a quick summary of what we're going to do, and then we're getting right into the text. We've completed, and we won't review. If, if you have a question for reviewing from last week, I will just refer you. I do apologize. I have not yet edited the video. There's just been some things. I really hope to have that video from last week posted tomorrow morning. And so if you have questions or you want to uh, watch the video again, Lord willing, it will be posted by tomorrow. So I, I do apologize for the lateness of the posting of the video and by God's grace it will be posted tomorrow morning. Uh, so just, just a quick overview of the session for tonight. Uh, we are going to discuss your questions and observations. So you had an assignment due tonight which was uh, Genesis 4 to 6. We will not be discussing that. We will be discussing your assignment number two which was the ob observations and questions from uh, the previous week on, on the fall and judgment of mankind. So we'll be discussing that first. Uh, next, we'll be working through the passage. So we'll just work through Genesis, uh, maybe pulling together some of your observations, maybe answering some of your questions, and really discussing the significance in the fall of mankind and the judgment, and really looking to see how the Bible understands it, how scripture understands it, and, and what truths we can gain, um, theological truths, we can gain from this and really just begin to see this big story unfolding uh, through, uh, through the, the judgment and even grace, even the gospel uh, is, is proclaimed in Genesis chapter 3. So I hope that we can see that tonight. Okay, and then uh, lastly, we are going to highlight those relationships to the big story. So that's the, the last thing. So um, without further delay, probably the quickest we've ever gotten into the new content, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter 3. I'll read it. As I read it, I want you to listen. You can also read along, but I would prefer that you that you would just listen to the words. If they're up on the screen. And as I read, maybe there's some new observations, some new questions. We're going to be uh, discussing what are your observations, what are your questions from the text. So let's go ahead and read the word of the Lord. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate. And she also gave some of it to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then both of their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together. And they made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord, the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 
And when the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Then he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you gave to be with me. She gave me the fruit of the tree. And what choice did I have? I ate. <laughs> My interpretation there, but you can see the sense. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent, he feed me. And I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he will rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth of for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread until you return to ground. For out of it you are taken, for you are dust. And to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. The Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and out of the east, gar gar the east of the garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming fire, a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. The word of the Lord. So, what are your comments and observations? And as I was reading, I saw something I never saw before. So I'm just going to mark it before I forget it. Uh, just coming back up here. This is something where you can read the word of the Lord a hundred times and you're going to see something new. So just coming up here, one thing I noticed here was that God says, um, he gives a reason here. This is a reason. Okay, He's, so this is, this is a reason. And what I noticed here is that, uh, I noticed here that because you have listened, so the action is, this is the action here. And what I find so interesting is because the actor is, The actor here is Adam. But what I notice here is that because you have listened to uh, the voice of your wife, and what I what I what I note here is that that he is listening to the voice of his life, to, of his wife, when he should be listening to the voice of God. He he chose the voice of his wife over the voice of God from chapter two. So I just. That was something that was very significant. And I just, that's so powerful because you see the voice of the Lord in chapter one. He does all the creation. Chapter two, he, he, he puts Adam in this huge blessed state. He gives him a command. He gives him several commands. And then, Siam. Adam listens to the voice of his wife instead of the voice of God. So that's just an observation I have here. Okay, what are your observations or your questions? Perhaps you'll, you'll be thinking of these. Let's start in verses, the, the first part. Verses, let's go back to verse number one. So let's just look through verses one and following. Uh, let's just quickly go at verse one. Any, any comments or observations 
that you had for verse one? And any questions or, or observations that you had for verse one? Yes. Go ahead. Can I have the first question? Go ahead. Why why is the serpent described here as crafty? In my in my in my copy of the Bible, it, it, the the description is subtle. Subtle, okay. Subtle. And what else do we have? And we'll just cycle around, Queen Boy. Um, anyone else have any anything stood out? Also, looking back at the previous context, anything else stand out about the previous context? From verse four to five. Oh, oh, Kui Boboy, we're just on verse one right now. So if you have oh, okay. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. I just, it'll be more precise. Yeah. Kind of, yeah, that's good. Okay, actually my, my observation is uh, one to five. There is the conversation of the serpent and Eve, but only on one subject. We, we know that uh, there is a conversation between two, and this is uh, Eve and serpent, right? And serpent. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna piggyback that. Isn't it so interesting that Adam, Adam and God are the primary actors in one and two, and Adam's been given the, the position, but yet the serpent so Adam's been given the position of leadership. It's very clear in the context. And the serpent doesn't go to the leader. He goes into the back door. Is that your observation? Yep. Yeah, no, that's really good. I was trying to make a follow observation that Adam somehow is left out in the conversation. Or maybe Adam was not there. Yeah, so, so he could not be there or he could be passive, right? There's two possibilities. So let's, yeah. so let's just put here, either, either passive, Adam is either passive or absent, right? Yeah. But just a side, we're just taking a, a quick side note, right? A sidebar is that when it comes to leadership, uh, leadership is challenged when you go in the back door. Yeah. Leadership is challenged. So there is, you really see the, the problem of leadership when people are not going to the leader. Yeah, no, that's great. There is, there is a great truth there. Excellent. Um, uh, what, what else do we have here? What else do we have here? Um, what, what are some other things that are, are significant in verse one? I have a couple more. I don't want to, I don't want to take them. Does anyone else have anything from verse one? I, I have several for myself, but I want to see if you have anything else. Uh, the serpent, the serpent was trying to to test Eve. If did uh, what really uh, what God really means? He said, "Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden?" In the the question is, any tree did. You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. Yeah, no. So, so yeah, go, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the question was, did God really, uh, did God actually say that you shall not eat any, it's a generic, that it means all three. You should not eat all three of the garden. Did God really say that? No, so this is excellent because I checked the Hebrew. So the Hebrew, the word is literally all. And that could be translated any or all. So, so even though you don't, you're not reading Hebrew, Henry is picking up on the point. The point here is that this is this this could also be a, a all. So what what what's happening here is that the number one, the serpent is misquoting. The word of God. Does everyone see that? Number one, he he's he's uh he changes it, right? He changes the word of God. He changes it. 
Let me, let me read what God said. Let, let's go back. Chapter 2. This is what the word of the Lord says. Chapter 2, it says, The Lord put the man in the garden, and, and the Lord God commanded man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. So, so the, 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 the quotation is... Number one, he changes it. Like, you may not eat from all or any of the tree, right? So number one, he changes it. And number two, uh, there is an omission. He omits the whole first half. Which is the blessing. Does everyone see that? So, so Satan is, it's a partial quote. And it's manipulated. <laughs> the twisting of the word of God. The twisting of the word of God. So I want everyone to really see this idea here. So what I want us to see here is that the serpent changes the word of God. And then he omits the positive part. And then actually we could say, let's just, we could say a third aspect is that there is a focus. A focus on the negative. <laughs> He's trying to set up Eve. He's trying to set up Eve. Viva. So it, this is really, this is how Satan works. It's not like God's going to kill you, Eve, right? He's not going to give just a complete lie. He's going to mix truth with error. Uh, we, we, we call it in cross-examination, in the art of cross-examination, a trap question. A, a what? Trap. A trap. A trap. Yeah, a trap. Yeah, no, this is, that's really good. Let's, let's, I'm going to add that. I like that. Trap. Trap, or we could also say manipulation. This is manipulation. Excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Any more questions on verse number one before we go on? I, I think, I think we're getting... They're good. Does anyone else have any other observations or questions? You notice, uh, Arthur, uh, the serpent used a word, actually. Actually. Did the word actually. Is it, did God actually say? Yeah. So, so let's, so let's. That's, that's, that's putting another doubt. That's putting doubt. Excellent. No, excellent. Excellent observation, and, and I agree with this. So this here, this is this is uh, questioning the word of God. Or we could say uh, bringing in doubt. So when we, when we read the Word of God, we do not approach the Word of God as a skeptic, as one doubting. We are to approach the Word of God by faith, by obedient faith. And here, uh, uh, Satan is, is bringing in doubt. He's bringing in, uh, he's questioning the Word of God. Excellent point. And so, should should be by faith. We talked about that before, obedient faith. Last week, we talked about how there's the covenant and Adam needs to cling and trust and obey what was commanded. And there was so much blessing mixed in with the prohibition. The blessing was greater than the prohibition. But the whole focus is upon he changes it, he omits part of it, he focuses on the negative, and then this could actually be number four. This could actually be number four here. He, he brings in doubt. He brings in doubt. <laughs> wow. So powerful. Anyone else want to add? We're going to move on. I, I, I have one other thing I want to add here. Does anyone else want to add something before we go on? The, the last thing I want, to I want to enter in here is that is that you have this identification of who the Lord God is. Who is the Lord God? And especially focusing upon 
this name. This is God's covenantal name. And it, and it emphasizes this, without going into the, the details of the name, we're probably going to have, when it's actually revealed to mankind, we'll have a discussion more. But there's three ideas here. Number one, presence. I, I, I taught this before. If you took, if you took my, uh, if you took my Christianity 101, this name signifies three things: presence, power, or we could say control, and number three, authority. And really, really, you see that both in the name Yahweh, which is the original Hebrew. And then also the Hebrew substitute because they did not want to misuse it. Adonai, the Lord, okay? And so you see these three things. So what's so interesting here is that in the serpent coming on the scene, he is questioning the presence of God. He is questioning the power and control of God. He's questioning his authority. And, and he's, he's trying to destroy uh God's covenant relationship with mankind that's been established that has been described as good. And, and Satan is the great destroyer. And I really want to, I really want to emphasize, um, this is how he operates. This is how he's going to continue to operate through the generations of mankind and of, and of history. Okay. Let's go on. Let's go on to verse number two. Let's look at verse number two. Let's look at the response. Kuya Bullboy already mentioned uh, Eve responds, but Adam should have been the one. Biblically, appropriately, Adam should have been the one to declare the word of God. So I just want to make a, a, an observation here that Adam, as prophet, remember, prophet is just the mouthpiece. Adam is the mouthpiece of God. So Adam as prophet should have spoken. Okay? That is, that is fundamental. Eve response. Now, what are some things that you, that, what are some observations or questions that you have here? Especially looking at what we've just identified, what are some things that we notice? What are some things that we notice? Does Eve respond biblically? Does she respond in faith? Looking at what we've already identified, talk to me about how Eve responds. Talk to me how Eve responds. She relied, she relied on her own recollection. She did not ask from Adam, who was supposed to be the first uh, resource person. Yes. Remember, Adam is the representative. The covenant of creation or the Adamic covenant, there's debate. You know, I don't want to get into those deeper issues. Regardless, Adam is the one that's supposed to proclaim the word of God. He's the one that's supposed to guard and keep the, the, the garden, okay? It's his responsibility. She should have said, Adam, there's a serpent who's challenging the word of God. Can you speak to him or it, whatever it is? She, so she does not defer to the one, the, the leader, number one. Excellent. Uh, what, what else do we have here? Look at her quotation. Look at her quotation and tell me, let's talk about her quotation. Did she accurately, so let's say, okay, she messed up by not asking Adam, but look at her quotation. Is she accurate? Has she done the right thing? What is your assessment concerning, compare her quote. So we, clearly Satan, a serpent, messed up the, the quotation, right? Does Eve respond accurately and appropriate? Look, look at the quotation. I'm not going to answer. I want you to tell me if she was accurate or not and where she went wrong. Eve omitted the word of God to eat freely in the, in the tree except for the... Uh, to eat freely in the in trees, <laughs> in the front of the trees except for the... 
uh, for, for the Genesis 2, verse 16, except for the tree of knowledge. But the tree of knowledge would. Excellent. So she omits the positive mandate, right? Eat, eat, all the, eat from any of the trees. She omits that, Viva. Number one. And then number two, uh, did you have another one? Well, what was the second one? So number one, she omits the positive command. So that's mistake number one. She does not accurately quote the word of God. Diba. What else does she mess up? She messed up. God did not say, God did not say, when you touch it, you will die. God says only when you eat it, you die. The word touch, it's an additional, additional word coming from give. So you have both an omission and an addition. Let me just quote for you. There's many passages of scripture. Let me just quote for you one passage a warning. This is coming from Revelation, but this would be typical. Okay, so this would, even though it's the specific example of Revelation, listen to what concerning the word of the prophecy, look at what the warning is. Uh, Revelation chapter 22, uh, verse 18, this, uh, verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come and let the one who hears say, come, let the one who is thirsty say, come and drink from the water of life without price. So it's a reference to, to, to the garden. Verse 18, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of the prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city as described in this book. So what I want us to see, Mama Kapatid, brothers and sisters, is that you do not add to the word of God, you do not take away. It's a recipe for disaster. It's a, it's a recipe for disaster. And in the garden, in the garden, man, man's first duty is to faithfully proclaim the word of God. And he fails. She fails. Let's, let me ask a question here. Uh, any other comments or, or questions? Any other comments or questions that you might have? In the word list, you die. Okay, so what's the observation? The, the, the warning? It's from It's different from God's word. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, God said, You shall, you shall surely die. No, that's really good. That's really you good. Yeah. Surely, surely. Yeah. No, that, yeah. that is this. This is beware, maybe. No. No, excellent point. I did not see that. That is really good. God, it's not a. It's not. It's not that just eating the fruit will kill you. It's that God will judge and you will die, as in the judgment of God will be upon them. Diva, is that, is that, that's what you're saying, correct? God's judgment will come. You will surely die, right? Yeah, that's really good. That is excellent. So really, both, both Eve and the serpent, <laughs> just abusing the word of God abusing the word of God. And, and I do want to say that this is, this as just a side note, this is why we have EBST. <laughs> if ever, if ever there is a reason for having Eastern Messiah School of Theology, it's because we want to accurately, biblically proclaim the word of God. We don't want to add to it. We don't want to take away from it. We don't want to change it to the best of our ability through the power of the Holy Spirit. We want to proclaim the word of God. And you can see that when the word of God is not faithfully and accurately proclaimed, uh, 
bad things are going to happen. In that uh, quotation of Eve, she described the, the forbidden tree as the tree in the midst of the garden. So uh, it's not the description of the tree, uh, the, which the forbidden fruit was not supposed to be eaten. So it could be it it could be part of the addition or the changing of the word. Yeah, let's let's yeah let's add it to the changing because really yeah, changing. she just totally misquotes it. She misquotes it. She abuses it. So here, so so actually, let's let's take one step farther. Is is Eve trusting? Is Eve clinging to? Is Eve trying to obey the word of God, or does she have doubt, or is she? We can't be a hundred percent sure, but in describing this, it seems that what would, how would you describe Eve's Eve's care, Eve's perspective on the Word of God? How can we describe? Let's just talk here for a second. My my take is she did not take it seriously when Adam told her about it. She was not probably listening carefully or. She was just taking it for granted as one of those um, things that can be seen in the garden. So she was not probably interested of what is the warning or what is the forbidden. Excellent. Remember, she's perfect. So, so it's not like she has a bad memory or she's or she has uh, some type of issue there, right? She. She has, she's, she's perfect. So, yeah, so it's most likely she's taking it lightly or perhaps she is uh, doubting. And so she's looking for, she's not, uh, uh, I, did you say careful in handling it? Is that what you said? Not taking it seriously. Yeah, careful or taking seriously, yes. So uh, Nanette says, Ati Nanette says, Eve's ignorance is exactly what God said, uh, of what God said was really Adam's responsibility. No, and that's another good point, Ati Nanette. It's possible that her ignorance could have also been Adam's fault. It could have been Adam's fault for not accurately. We just don't know. So, th so there could be an idea here of, that's definitely a possibility. Regardless, Adam and Eve are not exalting the word of God. They're not trusting in it. Let, let's at least say that there is a lack of trust. Okay, any other comments or can we go on? Uh, so if, this will be, if this will be a proper question in this context, uh, Tim, I, I read this question in one of the books of Philip Yancey. Okay. How can temptation happen in a perfect environment? So, no, so that's, we can write that down. I mean, uh, perhaps that's a philosophical question, clear <laughs> Let's write it down, but. Uh, as explained, as explained, the Garden of Eden is a perfect place. The Adam and Eve were still perfect. They have no. Uh, weakness, everything is there, but somehow temptation came in. So that's how the question was uh, premise. How could temptation occur in a perfect environment? So okay, so I can, I can't really. We can we can speculate, but we don't really have an answer for that, right? We the Bible never really clearly tells us why because that that's coming back to the the the, the problem of evil the body origin of evil and, and and the bible is not explicit it just it happens uh one uh one possibility in the context is that everything was created perfect but adam was not yet tested and proven right so adam as a as a, a created being was perfect but he but he and she eve they were not tested and proven um, uh, their, their, their faith, their, their decision-making was not tested. So 
that at least maybe moves in that direction, but I don't, I don't think we have that. We, it's not been get revealed to us. So let's think about it. But yeah, I think it's one of those philosophical questions that we might not be able to answer. Pastor Henry, you were going to make a comment. Yeah, observation. Go ahead. In continuing with Atinanet observation that Adam failed or Adam failed to 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 tell it to him what God said to him continuing with that because of that uh, Eve thought that the word or the instruction given to them or the character Eve, uh, Eve thought that the character of God is like a, he is too harsh to them yeah yeah, no, that's good. It's because the word he said, touch, the word touch, which she added, touch is, even touching, it will cause me to die. So it, it means uh, it's, a, it's a picture of God is too harsh to them. Instead of being a loving God becomes a God with ready, ready to spank. This is something to think about. She is actually... She is actually, in a sense, judging God. The creature has become the judge. Diba, the creature has become the judge. Diba, and and remember, we my interpretation is that Genesis one is the big picture, and then Genesis two, Genesis two gives more gives more details. And then Genesis 3 is, is, is the movement where there's actually the fall. But God is declaring everything good. God's declaring everything good. So if Genesis 2 is more expanding upon Genesis chapter 1, God is declaring everything good, but Eve is saying, no, his judgment, his command is too harsh. So whereas God says it was good, Eve is judging the judge. She is judging the judge. And that's a recipe for disaster. Excellent. Excellent. Let, let's move on here. So I think, I think we're moving along, getting to, so, to, getting to some conclusions here. Um, look at verse 4. Look at the response, again, of the serpent. Continuing this theme of quoting. So let's, let's, let's continue this idea of uh, quoting the word of God. So now, now we're going to look at the rest of the passage, was was Satan right or wrong? Look at the rest. Of, we've read Genesis 3. You've done your homework in Genesis 3. Was the serpent right or wrong in this these three lines of quotations? So you have a, a quotation you have here. This is one. This is two. And this is three, right? One, one is going back to chat to Genesis chapter two, Diba. Where is where is this line two and three going to? Do you see that in the context? I'm not going to. I'm going to wait to hear from you. Do you see that in the context? Genesis two is a quotation from from Genesis. Uh, uh, the first point is from Genesis chapter two. Let's look at line number one. Is that the truth or is that a lie? Or, or how would you describe this quotation? That's a total lie. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. God said, you shall surely die. So Genesis 3, verse 4, you will not die. Should, you will not surely die. This is a total lie. Yeah. A reverse of what, what God said. So, so it's, a, it's number one, this is a lie, right? This, so this here is a, this is a lie. But looking at the rest of Genesis chapter three, does, does Adam and Eve die? When they eat the fruit, 
Do they die when they eat the fruit? Physically, they did not. Physically, they did not. So he could have said, die yet. <laughs> Maybe that becomes the truth. You will not surely die yet. <laughs> right? Because this is where it's a twisting. Uh, in one sense, he is correct. They ate the fruit and they did not die. Right? And so he's, this is a lie because it's not quoting the truth. But it's, again, this twisting. It's, it's a partial truth because when they ate the fruit, they did not immediately die. And that's what Eve is thinking, right? Ibasa, this is, again, a lie and it's, and it's a, 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 a manipulation of the truth. Right? It's a manipulation of the truth. And then what about here? For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. Is that the truth? Is that a true statement? Look at the context and tell me if that's a true statement. The context, I think the context it is, it is true. Yes, it's true. So, so the first line is, is, is partially, it's, it's a lie, but it's also a manipulation because they would not surely die yet. So there's a partial truth there. Line number five, that's coming off of verse number, that's coming off of verse number, number, where is it? Number seven, right? This is, this is being quoted by uh, Genesis 3, 7, Biba. Their eyes were opened. Look at verse now uh, 22, 3, 22. Look at Genesis 3, 22. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out and take his hand and also the tree of life and live and live forever. And so that therefore they, he blocks the gate, right? So this is true. And this is true. So, so you really see just a complete... He is really mixing this truth with error. Everyone needs to see this. Okay, everyone needs to see this. This is how Satan is working from the beginning. And in, in, in contemporary knowledge, you have many, you have these great pastors, you have these great teachers, and, and, and you'll listen to what they say, and they'll say a lot of good things. You're like, man, I agree with that. That's really good. And then there's just a little bit of like, ah, what's he saying there? Oh, it's okay. It's okay. You know, they're really mixing. Halo, halo, talaga, right? It's really a mixing. It's really a mixing. And unless we are really guarding and we really know the word of God, we will be fooled. This is how Satan works. He mixes a whole lot of truth with a little bit of error. Okay, let's move on here. Unless you have another question. Does anyone have another question or comment? Let me just take a step back. Um, if you see observations from the other portions of the reading that's applicable to this passage, you can also include those as observations. Okay, we're kind of drawing everything in here. So if you have an observation from later on in the scripture, you can also add that as well. Um, I do, I do want to say something else here. When he said, when, 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 when Satan says you will be like God, that is accurate, right? This is a comparison. And, and this is how they will be like God, right? They are going to know. They are going to know. And then what they're going to know is they're going to know what good and evil is, right? Up until this point, let's just make some observations here. Number one. God has determined what is good. Diba, God has been the one determining what is good. What man should be doing is man should be trusting or depending upon God. That's the first big thing. God determines what's good, and man should be trusting and depending on what God, for, for everything, for life, for wisdom, for knowledge. And, and then uh, um, number two, they become like God in the sense that they, uh, knowing 
good and evil, if they know good and evil, then they are making, now they are determining, right? They are like God in that sense. Or we can say independent, right? Now they are thinking on themselves. The problem is they are not like God in uh, number one. How are they not, or number three, uh, not like God in A, power, B, wisdom, C, self-existent, life and then the list can go on those are the big ones so they're only like god in the area of that they're they are determining their own way they are determining their we call this uh independent or autonomous so they're only like god in the area of their autonomy and determining their way. But they don't have wisdom, they don't have power, and they don't have self-existence. So, Sayam Talaga, there is truth. Yes, you will be like God determining your own way, but that way is cigarette of death, right? They can't save themselves. They don't have the wisdom. They don't have the power. So it's really, this is the deceit of Satan. Okay, let's go ahead. Let's take a let's take a break, and then we're going to try to get through this. We're going to go a little bit faster, um, but I hope that this is really coming together for you. Um, I, I hope that you're really thinking about this, and we, as we work through these things, I hope that you're also seeing that this is really the prototype. This is the prototype. Is the first type of how mankind's sinful nature is going to just continue, continue downhill. You're going to see this type of behavior through all of the history of mankind, even to the present. There is no new thing under the sun. So really, this is the prototype for sin. This is the prototype for man's behavior. This is the prototype for man's manipulation of the word of God. This is the prototype for man's self-autonomy. You're just going to see this cyclical, uh, a, a cyclical. It's going over and over again. So let's go ahead and take a break. And uh, we will come back in uh, at uh, eight ten. So eight ten sharp, we will start. All right. So uh, let's go on here. We are we are moving quickly towards the end. So I'm just gonna, unless you have a really good observation, I'll just start talking through some of these things. You could jump in. I do want to go to several important passages to that kind of unfolds these. Um, um, uh, so let's just move on here. So the woman is the actor and she and she this is the action she sees and her focus is upon the fruit and there's three things there's three things that really tempt her number one the tree was good for food number two it was a delight to the eyes and then number three there was this desire to make one wise. And what I want to really highlight here is this is uh, to be like God. So the real, the real sin, did it occur in the physical act or had it already occurred beforehand in the heart? And, um, the judgment is for the act, but the sin had already occurred in the heart. And we know that because J Jesus clearly specifies, if you say in, in, in Matthew 5, uh, 21 and following, if you, if you hold hate in your heart, you've already committed sin. You've already committed murder. If you have lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. If you covet in your heart, you've already committed um, sin. So, so, we're on safe ground that, that there, a sin has already been committed and then that inward heart carries out the act. Uh, I do want to 
Um, I do want to point out here that if you have other time, uh, first, first John chapter two, verse 16, really it gives slightly different, gives a slightly different perspective that I think we need to follow John's interpretation. What he calls this is the desire of flesh. The desire of the eyes. And then this, this pride of life. And again, so this is going to here, this is going to here, and this is going to here. And I think that does, those do help us. And when we look at it like this, John is saying, this is, John defines this as uh, all that is in the world. So what I want to say here is that although this is the first sin. Well, this is the first, uh, the first sin of the heart. The, these really are comprehensive for, for describing all the sins that occur in the world. Okay? This idea of being controlled by the flesh. You're controlled by the flesh. Your, your, your eye, your eye, your covetousness, your eye controls you desire of the flesh could even be more than just a physical need it could be a lack of self-discipline so this could be anger this could be violence this could be addiction this could be um anything this you know addiction to power addiction to to um to food to drugs to materialism it, these, this is in, su in some sense, this is, we, we would call this like a prototype. Or, you know, a prototype in a vehicle is the first vehicle, right? A prototype is the first. This is the first, but it, in one sense, it's the fundamental issue with, with, with mankind's, uh, what will become our sin nature, okay? And if you notice, if you have time, this is really what uh, Jesus' temptation. And even if you look at this, uh, you have Jesus' temptation. You have in Exodus through Leviticus, you have the temptation of Israel. And these are just going to they're just gonna continue to cycle through. And actually you could say they're gonna it's gonna go like this. Or you could say it's like this. Until there's a judgment. So how you want to define it, this is like a downward, this is a this is uh, this is getting bigger. This is down downward, um, but it's also going through time. So everyone's tracking with me, and so this is really this is the this is the foundation for how we need to understand this, how how our sin nature operates, where temptation comes from, and then we have these series of actions here. She, she takes the fruit, she eats it. She then gives some to the husband. He eats it. And then you have this massive, this massive uh, movement where their eyes are opened. They know they're naked. They sew fig leaves together. They make for themselves, this is a covering here. And then when they hear God coming, they hide themselves. And so this is how we work. <laughs> this is what happens. Uh, this, this here is this idea of, of guilt. 
Guilt is when you know that you've broken a law. Okay, so you experience guilt. When you do something wrong, you experience this guilt. Whether it's an anger, whether it's you, you have this guilt. The, the covering, the covering is shame. So they experience shame, right? They see that they're naked and they, they number one, they know they're guilty. And then also they want to cover themselves. They, they are experiencing shame, okay? And then when they hear the Lord coming, they hide themselves. And of course, this could be because they're guilty, because they're shaming, but Adam will say that it's because of fear that, he, that they hid themselves. So there's fear. So in this story, we see guilt, we see shame, and we see fear. And we all experience this in our own lives as we commit sin. So this prototype is also how, how we act in sin. Is everyone tracking with me? Is everyone tracking with me there? Any questions or comments before we go on? Uh, before we skip, uh, in the sequence of events up to the time when Adam ate the fruit, there is no mention that Adam said something or resisted eating or even scolded Eve as we would normally do this. Is there an explanation? To that? I would say that th what this is showing is incredible passivity. I think we can say that. I think there's incredible passivity. You see that? You see that? In... <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a problem for some men um so i think that adam was incredibly passive that's my interpretation it doesn't say we know that he was not deceived we just know that he disobeyed but he but but he really i, I think we can say passive he does not he is not aggressive he doesn't he does not uh not aggressive not speaking Uh, we, we would also say not fearful because he takes, not until the act. So, so I mean, I, I, think, I, think, I think there's a real sense of passivity here. But that, that's, that, I think, is what the text is saying. He's, because, and I think the fact that he is there, I think that he was present. I think he saw this go down. And, it's, you know, the worst, the worst of the worst could have been he wanted to see if he died and <laughs> that he was going to take. Perhaps he wanted to see what was going to happen to Eve, right? Eve, Eve took it, and then he took it second. So perhaps, and of course, he might not have been there. So we just don't know. Um, I do think that we're, I think that we're on good grounds with saying there's a sense of passivity there because when she gives it to him, there's no, there's no, there's no resistance, right? There's no resistance. We can see that. He doesn't, there's no resistance and there's no arguing. He doesn't say, Eve, what are you doing? There's nothing like that. And I think, that's, I think that's significant. I think all of this comes back to, I think this is all pointing to that. Yeah. And, and you, looking throughout Genesis, you see that. You see that the men take great steps of faith, but they're also passive. Abraham is passive in his home, letting his wife do what she wants. Even some really, <laughs> some really, bad, some really bad decisions she makes, and he just goes along with it. You see a lot of times this passivity in the home. Um, so anyway, uh, any other questions or comments or we can move along? Okay, the other thing I want to see here is that you, you continue to see the name, the Lord God, okay? And again, what's, what, what, what is always being conveyed is this idea of presence, authority, He's the one in control. He's the one that can judge. He's the assessor. He's the one who assesses, okay? Um, but when you, once they commit the sin, look at the, what, look at the big effect of sin. Sin, sin separates from the presence of God. So, so what we're going to really see here, brothers and sisters, is that the sin separates 
And unless God acts, unless God acts, there is no way for, re, for a reunion. God has to act. And the whole rest of the big story is God, God bringing me. So, so just imagine here. So if we're, if we're looking, uh, you, have, you have the presence of God here. And this is the creation. Right? With the, with the sin of man, you have this separation from the presence of God. Right? And so the whole picture of creation is bringing this back together. The presence is being, is, God's goal is bringing this separation back. So from garden to garden, this separation, God is the one that's going to be acting. God is the one that's going to be acting to, to, to bring back the presence. So, so think about this. Think about this. When God speaks to the patriarchs, to Adam, to, to, so sorry, to Abraham, to, to Isaac, to Jacob, right? They're at times in the presence of God, right? He'll come to their presence. And so they, they, they worship him in Beth El. They worship him in, 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 different, in, in different places. Uh, in, in Exodus, um, the tabernacle is the place where God will dwell among his people. After the tabernacle, it's the temple. And then in the New Testament, it's the dwelling place of God is going to be in his son. He, he dwelt among us. We're going to see this. So what I want us to see here is this big, this major theme through scripture is going to also be the, the, the presence of God. The presence of God is a major theme that we need to be tracking. Here we have uh, sin, rebellion, so this is a big theme. This is also a big theme. Tell me, this is connected, this is connected then with the gospel, correct? The dwelling of God with man. Um, Romans 5.1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Peace with God. So then moving along here, we have this uh, God approaches man. So he calls out to the man and he asks him a question. Right? So this is also helpful when we're dealing with sin. This is also a great pattern for us to practice. When you're dealing with sin and, or you're dealing with someone who you think has committed sin, you just go to them and say, what happened? <laughs> you just ask one question. Where are you? And Adam's response is, I heard the sound of you in the garden, but I was afraid. There's the fear. And this leads to hiding himself. Okay, and then, and then God's question becomes more pointed. Question that probes. God is giving man the chance to come clean. This is an opportunity. In, 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 in the book of Law, when you read, uh, in the context of due process, yeah, is this is the first example of due process? <laughs> no, so excellent. So what's what we're, what what Kuya Bulboy is saying is that is that this is the prototype, and then by analogy, in our own lives, in the own law practice, is that we we're following the pattern that God has given to us, and this is really the pattern of of. Biblical restoration. This is the prototype for biblical restoration, right? He's, he's giving the opportunity for Adam to repent and to confess. Now look at Adam's response. Look at Adam's response. What happens? Adam has the chance. Adam has the chance. 
Kuya Henry, you were in our prayer. We compared, right, the prayer of David to the prayer of Saul. Uh, the, the confession of David, the prayer of confession of David, and, and of Saul. Remember our description of Saul? What did we say Saul, what was his behavior when, when Saul was confronted by Samuel? Henry, do you remember what the behavior uh, was? Or actually, Bobo, Bobo was also in the class. What was uh, Saul's response? Saul blamed blame the people. Uh, the people. <laughs> Here. Other people. Yeah. So, Henry, I'm sorry. We cut you off this moment. Did okay. you want to add? I'm sorry. Yeah. In he did not admit that he is a sinner. He blamed other people. That's what uh, Bubo is saying. So, so let's look at this. Look at, look at this. Um, who, does, who does Adam blame here? Who does Adam blame here? He's blaming Eve, the woman. He's blaming Eve. <laughs> really? Uh, he's blaming God. <laughs> he blames God. The woman who you gave to me. It's like you gave me a dysfunctional, problematic, it's your fault, God. Right? So he blames God here. Um, because look at this. This here, this is a description. This is unnecessary. Think about this. Has God been in this story? No, there's no mention of him. He's not present at all. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the woman who you gave to me, <laughs> he's really, this is really bad. This is Sayang Talaga, Sayang Talaga. He blames God. And then here, Kuya Bobo is correct. He then blames the woman. Now it is interesting that he doesn't blame the serpent. So perhaps he wasn't present when Eve was deceived. That is possible because he does not, Cigarado, if he was there, he would say, and then the serpent that you created, Cigarado. Maybe Cigarado, he would do that. <laughs> Just blame it, everyone. Just like Saul. Just like Saul. And Mano Kapitid, when, when you approach someone in a sin, this is the prototype for repentance and confession. There are some people, when you catch them, yes, I've sinned. Please forgive me. I've done what's wrong. Please. But it, when they start pointing fingers and blaming, oh, I was busy. I just didn't have the time to confess to you. Oh, you know, it was not really my fault. I was under so much stress. I could not, you know, or, or no, 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 no. You know, they, you know the, the, the woman was naked. She was taking off her clothes. Don't you understand, honey? I, I had to engage, you know, what was I supposed to do, right? So, so when, when there is a lot of blaming, 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 you know there is no repentance and there's no genuine heart change. And if you look at all of the, through scripture, a, a genuine heart, is one that confesses and forsakes. He repents, confesses, forsakes. Proverbs is so true. The one who covers his sin will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes his sin will receive mercy. So he, he blames everyone. And then in the, in the words of Saul, I had no other option. I had no other option. I had to eat. I ate, right? So this is now, this is now uh, his act, his act at the end, okay? Then, then God also gives Eve the chance. Eve, what have you done? <laughs> Eve, what have you done? So then there's another chance. Again, question. The serpent deceived me and I ate. So again, there, the blame is upon the serpent, Diba. Right? The blame is the serpent. Now, if you notice this, God doesn't ask the serpent. <laughs> Perhaps it's because of, it's what Henry said, that, you know, the serpent is Satan, he's already fallen, and so God knows the character of the serpent. Either it's being personified, or, or God knows the heart of the serpent. Let's, let's look at a passage of scripture. So perhaps here, this is not, this is just, you know, we don't know the complete origin of, of Satan, but we can at least look at how 
so this is the image of the great dragon, okay? But just look, look at how the great dragon is described, okay? Uh, there, we have this great dragon here. He was thrown down. That, that ancient serpent, <laughs> who was called the devil, Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. <laughs> so when we look at the serpent in the garden, it's Satan. It's the deceiver. It's the devil. Uh, perhaps we'll unpack this more. We don't have a lot of time tonight. But what I want to say is that uh, it's more than an animal. However, we're going to, to view this. It's, 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 it's a creature that... Um, I don't think he's just possessing the creature. I think that it's some type of, it's, 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 uh, it's more than, it's not that Satan's possessing the creature. So whether it maybe it's a, a physical manifestation of a serpent, a ser perhaps we just, we just don't have the information. We don't have the details. But what we can say is that Satan, this angelic being, he is identified as that ancient serpent. And so we as reading scripture wisely, we have to accept that. This is Satan, this is the devil, this is the deceiver of the whole world who is the one deceiving, okay? Any comments or questions or it, it seems to be self-explanatory. Okay, moving on here. Uh, the, Lord, the Lord curses the serpent. What's going to happen here is judgment, okay? There's going to be now a judgment, okay? Now, this is my question. Did God, did God give a command to the serpent? Do we have an example of God giving a command to the serpent in Genesis 1, 2, or 3? Yes or no? Not a trick question. Is there a command? It's a decree, not okay, a so command. So, okay, so I'm just saying explicitly, sorry, let me be clear. So I'm saying, is, was there explicitly written in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 a command given to the serpent? I, I don't think so. I don't think he gave him a command. Yeah, there's, there's, no, there's no command given, correct? But God just pronounces judgment. So does everyone see that what's happening here? There's no, there's, let me just write this down. No explicit command to the serpent that we know of. Right? There's, there, it's not there, okay? So the question is, how can God, how can God judge? So the big question is, uh, how is God just in judging? Right? Paul says if there's no law, if there's no command, you can't have, you can't have a judgment, right? And then, and, then, and then Adam says, yet, before the law, people died. So the point that Paul is making is that clearly in, in the presence of death, there is a judgment. There is a law. So what I want us to see here is that what is, let's just talk, what is presupposed, presupposed is what's already understood is that there is an existing law, okay? And there is, there is this covenant that binds. Does everyone understand that? What I'm trying to say is that we, you, there has to be a law and there has to be a covenant that binds the creation to, to, to do what the creator is saying Otherwise, he is unjust in judging them. Just take a moment to think about that and ask a question if that does not make sense. L let me use an analogy. If I don't give a command, so I could give a commandment to, to the neighbor's daughter, okay? I could say, don't cross the street. Am I, am I just in, in disciplining her if she crosses the street? I would be wrong. I, I, I am not her parent. You know, I could give her the command all she, all she, she's not going to listen to me. Now, perhaps she will if she knows me, but some, some, some other 
random teenager that's walking down the street, I say, go home. They just laugh at me, right? There's no, there's no, there's no covenant. There's no, there's no authority relationship that binds them to me to where I can then enact a punishment. Is everyone tracking with me? So what must be presupposed is there has to be this, if we're talking about creator and creation, right? There has to be a covenant relationship. There has to be a law. If there will be a just judgment. Is everyone tracking with me? It has to be. If there's no covenant and if there's no law, God is not just in judging. He is an unjust God. So what we need to see here is that whenever we see judgment in the scriptures, whenever we see judgment, we need to be thinking about, ah, there's a law. Ah, there's a covenant. Okay? And everyone sees this in the text. Any questions or comments? Everyone is tracking with me here. Everyone's tracking with me? Everyone's following with me? So there is a law, and, and there is a law already yes now for 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 adam for adam and and eve and especially within the physical created order diba so so what is the what is the law that's already been given let's just explicitly label it out okay number one explicitly in the context we know that there's a creation and adam is the king right adam is the king of the creation there's a garden he is to care for the garden he's to guard the garden He's also to name the animals, and he's also to eat from the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil, of evil. I mean, he's, he's to eat from the tree, all the trees, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Those are, ex, that's the law. I, I mean, explicitly. Of course, there's other, there, Paul will talk about God's law being written on the hearts. There, there's, there's more, we can go into a deeper discussion concerning God's eternal covenant of uh, uh, with creation. I, I don't want to go down that path because it's very deep. What I want us to at least see here is that explicitly in the context of Genesis, there's at least four or five commands that form this law that binds all creation uh, in covenant with God so that he can then judge. So, so, so the serpent explicitly, uh, even though he doesn't eat of the fruit, he challenges, he challenges the king, Adam, he usurps yeah. the authority. Diva? Okay. Yeah, uh, in Genesis 1 or 2, when God created man, he said, you, you, he has given man authority. Yes. Uh, he said, subdue it. So yeah. all God's creation, that, that are the living, all God's living creation are subject to man's authority. So, and that is the law. And Satan <clears throat> tried to defy God through Eve and Adam. So that was the that was the 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 the, the offense of Satan against God by deceiving man. Yes. Now, now so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. instead now, of being to man, he becomes, um, he makes himself equal or even higher to man. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and the other thing too is that what we'll see is that um, this is for a deeper class, we're a basic level, but there is, the, there is this eternal law of God that's on our heart, even on the Gentiles. Paul will say that in, 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 in uh, Romans chapter 2. So what I want to say is that there is, there is if, if we're looking at, we can go much deeper than this. I want to at least just for the, 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 the for the class, this class, at least we can agree that there is this Adamic covenant with creation. Okay. We can at least agree there. There is debate concerning the deeper levels of God's covenant, of God's everlasting covenant, of, of, of God's eternal law. Fair enough. That can be for another class. But what I want to at least see here is that there is this violation of this Adamic covenant and God's covenant with creation. And 
So the so God is completely just in judging the serpent, a hundred percent just. And 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 so we have to have this in order for it to make sense. In order for us not to to accuse God of being unjust, we have to have this presupposition, which the text has, that there's a they're in covenant relationship, and there is a law, and all three of them have violated it. We have to have that. That maintains. Okay. And then that this is going to be the prototype for how God interacts with through all time as he brings back. So this is, again, the biblical foundation for God's interaction with mankind and creation, okay? So this is so fundamental, all right? Let, let's just move along here now. Um, um, it is getting late. Uh, I think we're going to stop because it's already, it's already um, 8.53 and it's becoming late. Um, I don't want to, because if we go into the next topic, let, let me just at least talk, let me just at least uh, make a comment about the gospel and then we'll end it there. And then we can continue next week. I just, I don't want to take your time because it's already late. Maybe you have to go somewhere to get home. Just looking here, we have this, we have this, uh, we have several, um, we have this idea of curse. So when we're talking about curse, where have we heard Thinking about this idea of curse, where else in scripture do we have do we have this idea of curse? Can anyone think about other contexts where there's curse? Cain and Abel? Yes, no, so we're gonna see that. Uh, Cain has a curse. Excellent. So I'm I'm thinking though, I'm thinking in scripture, big categories. We're talking about covenant. Are there any big categories of curse in the Old Testament or the New Testament? Uh. In Deuteronomy. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Moses was saying, uh, if you disobey God, curses will follow. If you obey, blessings will, you will enjoy blessings. But if you disobey, you will have curses. So part of the old covenant is the blessing or the cursing. Okay. And so what we're going to see in the Abrahamic covenant, was there a curse? Was there a curse and blessing? Let's, let's look now at the Abrahamic covenant. Is there a blessing and cursing in the Abrahamic covenant? Can anyone think about the What was the blessing in the Abrahamic covenant? All, all families of the earth will be blessed. The, so the, the blessing of all families, right? What is the curse? There's a curse in not taking the sign. If you don't take the sign of the covenant, you will be cut off. You will be cursed. So you have to, the, the, the curse, there's a curse for not taking circumcision. And also if you curse Abraham, right? Those who curse you, I will curse. Viva. Let me just read Genesis 12. Genesis 12. Go from your country and to your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who dishonor you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Again, I'm bringing out this idea that because of their failure to keep this covenant, whatever it, whatever it is, we can, we can discuss that. We know that the covenant is present because of, of this idea of cursing. What I'm trying to get at is that these are, these are creatures and they are in covenant with God. Everyone tracking? You have this serpent that's cursed because of what he's done. So, so again, there's not only is Adam and Eve in covenant, but also the serpent broke covenant with the creator by usurping that authority, okay? Um, and so the cursing is he's cursed above all livestock, on the belly he will go, dust he will eat, all the days of his life. And then here we go. This is what theologians refer to as the proto-evangelium. 
What is that word? What is that word? The first proclamation of the gospel. The first proclamation of the gospel. So we have, this is biblical foundations. Last week we had kingdom, covenant, marriage, uh, uh, prophet, priest, king. Here we have the, the, the proto-sin <laughs> that sends us all into this curse. We also have proto-judgment, the first judgment. It's going to continue. It's going to continue and grow. And here we have the proto-evangelium, the proclamation of the gospel. And what is this proclamation? The proclamation is uh, the promise that there's going to be an offspring. that will kill the serpent. You will bruise, he will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. So what I want us to see here is that right in Genesis, the gospel is, becomes explicit. The gospel becomes explicit. And what, I, and, and what we're going to see, we're going to end here because it's already 9 o'clock. We're going to finish this tomorrow. We're going to finish this next week. But what I want us to see, brothers and sisters, is that from Genesis onward, there is not two gospels. There's not two salvations. The, the, the big picture is this. This, we've been separated from God because of sin, and God is taking acts to bring us back into relationship with him. We're going to finish looking at the curses of the man and the woman next week. But what I really want us to see is this idea of the gospel, that this is the very core of the gospel. This is, so just imagine that this is the ground here. Uh, they will say that this is the seed. This is the seed, and from this rose the flower in genesis 3:15 you have the first telling of the gospel and then this is the promise that the the curse is going to be undo that God is going to do away with death in Christ. And we're going to really explore this more next week. And so as uh, this is not to say that God is making this plan as he goes along, uh, everything, everything that is, that is in God's plan is contained in the seed, Biba. And then the seed just grows. The seed grows into the flower. Okay, and so what I want to say here is that is that the seed, the first telling of the gospel, this he will bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. It's not that it changes. It's not that God adds to it. It's just that he slowly reveals to, to us in types, in persons, in places. And so we see the, the growth of sin through, in your homework, through Cain, through Lamech, uh, through the sin of, of, of mankind. We see God's judgment continuing to be, to be revealed and poured out and to be clarified what God's judgment looks like. We also see God revealing to us the blessing, the, 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 the plan that he, is, that he wants to dwell. He's lost his ability to dwell among man because of sin. The sin has separated man from God. The sin has separated man from God, and God is working to bring us back together from garden to garden, okay? So I want to close on this point, and I want you to be thinking about this, that this is really, this is the big problem. And now we're going to see the big story. The rest of the Bible is this uh, bringing man back into relationship with God and revealing to us who God is and what his will is for our lives. That's it. That's the purpose for the scripture. Um, in, in some sense, these other questions about the origin of evil, 
or in, you know, uh, we should discuss those, but God doesn't mention them perhaps because that's not significant to his purpose, right? Perhaps. Um, and that's not to say that we shouldn't discuss, we should go deep. Um, but, 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 but focusing on this big idea that we have sinned, uh, we'll, we'll see how that we have really taken the place of God. We'll expand this more, how man has taken the place of God. We want to be God. We want to be autonomous. And yet God in his grace is bringing us back, <laughs> bringing us back to the garden. Uh, let's go ahead and close in prayer and you'll be dismissed. Can I have Haggai? Are you there, Haggai? Can you pray for us? Hello, Pastor Tim. Hi, Haggai. Let's Oh. Okay. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, tonight for giving us the opportunity to learn about your word and your gospel through uh, Pastor Tim. May you uh, give us the wisdom and understanding on what you want to show us, Lord God, uh, in your uh, gospel, in your word. Uh, on what we learned tonight. May you protect uh, those who are going home tonight and may you uh, continue to bless uh, uh, the country, your church, your people amidst the pandemic. And may you continue to heal those who are sick and may we continue to do your will, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.